Hello, this is episode 17 and today we are talking about the four cable method and we have a guest from Nashville. Hmm, the four cable method, you know, <laughs> I was using that phrase in Nashville and some kind of guy in Nashville said, you know, I'm more like a one cable method kind of guy, you know. So let me explain the four cable method uh, and we really start at the beginning. So one cable, oops, is a guitar cable that goes into an amplifier. One cable, amp, one cable method, okay? <laughs> Okay, one cable, no problem. Two cable is, I use the guitar cable into one effects and I have a second cable going into the input of the amplifier. That is what I would call the two cable method. Nobody says that, but okay, it's guiding you to the four cable method. So first bypass and then Okay, so you see two cables, guitar cable and a patch cable from my effects pedal into the amplifier. A three cable method would be something like that. I would use one cable into the amp and I would use the effects loop from my amplifier. So the send into the input of the delay and the return into, oops, I get rid of this fellow here. So see this? One cable is guitar, second cable is send, third cable is return. That's the three cable method. And now we can... Okay, that's the three cable method. One, two, three. And now finally we come to the four cable method, which goes back into this green frog, which is guitar cable, patch cable to the input. Oops, stay here, please. And the two patch cables for the effects that is in the effects loop. <laughs>
Okay, so this was the countdown from one to four. Why do we use this many cables and what is it good for? So we know there are effects and the effects in the old days have only been used in front of the amplifiers because the amplifiers didn't have any effects loops. And the reason for effects loop is very simple. Because if you have like time-based effects in front of the amp, you can hear it's getting really muddy. I make an example with this beautiful, what is it, uh, lexicon reverb uh, from DoD. They have done a beautiful pedal with the original lexicon uh, chip. Let's listen to a reverb. Okay, that comes alive. <laughs> in front of the amplifier. Okay, and for that we have, I switch off the delay first, so, and I switch off the internal de uh, reverb of the amp one. So we listen to that. Aha, here is our lexicon reverb. On the clean channel, Sounds pretty good. So there is nothing wrong having a reverb pedal in front of a real clean amp. That's not a problem. So the reverb still has the nice definition and uh, yeah, it is um, transparent and it's not muddy. So works, okay? And of course, if I had an overdrive pedal in front of that reverb and would leave the clean channel on the amp one, it would sound killer, no problem. But once I want to use the dirty channel of my amp, for example, here on the amp one, this reverb now gets a little bit uncontrolled. <laughs> Okay, you get a picture. Hmm. And if I put that reverb now into the effects loop, let's get rid of that cable and plug in the reverb. Uh, let's do it like that. I plug in the guitar in the amp and use the reverb in the loop. we get a killer tone. Now, the amp is overdriven and the reverb is clean. And this is the magic. Killer reverb, by the way. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. We can compare this to the M1 reverb, which is not lexicon, it's my own design, but... This sounds more like a spring, and this is like a really high quality lexicon plate reverb. Killer reverb. Okay, so we have to learn you can put all kinds of pedals in front of the amp and that's the old school way. Maybe we can show our little picture here that we prepared and in case you are using overdrive pedals in front of time-based pedals and use only the clean channel of your amplifier, that actually works, that makes sense and it sounds good. But when you want to use your beautiful overdrive channel from your amp, doesn't matter what kind of amp it is, it could be any Marshall, any, you name it, Boogie, Bogner, blah, blah, blah. 
a pedal that is time-based like a delay or a reverb most of the time should be used in the effects loops because the effect loop guarantees that the signal is clean. So the overdrive comes from the amp and then the amp signal, which is overdriven, is fed into the reverb or the delay, the time-based effect, and comes back to the power amp. And that's the way how to make a beautiful, nice, transparent, uh, clean tone. And this was leading into our next picture, where we split the signal into kind of two effects groups. One is the pre-effects, which usually is like overdrive pedals, booster pedals, compressors, EQs, uh, all the kind of stuff that you want to have in front of your amp to change the character of the amplifier or the overdrive that you create with the amplifier. And then you have all those time-based effects um, like delay and reverb, which you can use in the effects loop. And then you kind of have both, best of both worlds. So pre-effects and post-effects. And that's then using the four cable method. This is what I showed you at the beginning, beginning, which is four cables. One is the guitar into the first pedal, which is pre. Then there is the output cable of the pre-effect into the amp. And then there is the effect sent to the post effect and the effects return into um, the effects return goes into the output of your post effect. Okay, so this is the fun <laughs> fundamental knowledge you have to know about the four cable method. I've been using the four cable method even without knowing that there was a four cable method because this was clear to me a anyhow. When, the, when there's an effects loop and I have a pedal in front of the amp, that's already a four cable method. It has nothing to do if you do it with analog pedals or if you do it with uh, digital pedals or whatever. And nowadays we see a lot of very powerful digital multi-effects that have tons of options, tons of effects, all kinds of effects like boost pedals, like drive pedals, like time-based delays, like reverbs and everything you can imagine all in one pedal. But how to use it and mix it out together with maybe your amp one or with any amp that has an effects loop. This is the way how to combine um, the amp and effects with the four cable method. And today I want to show you a very popular device by the brand Line 6. Line 6 is famous for doing modeling amplifiers. Oh, it goes back last century, I don't know, 90s or even earlier. Um, I think the first one I saw was, was AX2 and then the red, uh, you know, the pot and all that stuff. And of course they had some effects and now they offer um, a, a range of different effects devices. Um, and of course um, you can use those standalone and it sounds pretty good, but they are just digital effects units with some nice modeling. Um, my personal opinion on that is it sounds pretty good, but doesn't feel like a real amp. Me growing up on the old good old tube amps, and by the way, here is my 19, oh gosh, I have to look at this. This is back, this is a 50 watt plexi um, that I was giving to a friend of mine from Gladius Amps. Um, yeah, he brought it back. Um, so if you're used to this kind of real deal amplifiers, a digital defect device, effects device is not giving me the same feel. It maybe it's giving me the same tones, but it doesn't feel the same way, at least not for me. And so what you can do is combining the beauty of an analog amp, like my amp one or whatever amplifier you, you like to use um, with the digital world, with those multi-effects. And um, you are free to do any combination. So we do have a little pedal board um, that I want to put on here. And this is giving us the nice line six thing. So, okay, I just simply unplug the whole thing here. 
Thank you, brother. Effects and bye bye. And here we go. We don't need you anymore. And then bye bye, Mr. M1 here. Mm -hmm. So, this is my little. one board and what else just a guitar just a sip of this mm -hmm. mm. so I now use <laughs> This is the Line 6 HX effects in 4 cable method with the Blue Guitar M1. Let's check the cabling. The guitar, as you can see, goes into the input of the HX effects. Okay? Then we have the output of the HX effects going into the effects return, which is the last thing. So this is like the first cable and the last cable. And in between we have a loop which is active on the HX effects with a send and that goes into the input of the amp1 so we can have guitar signal into the HX effects we have pre-effects and at the end of the pre-effects we use the send to feed the signal into the amp1 input and then the send of the amp1 goes into the effects loop return okay and then from the return in the HX effects we have another set of effects which are the post effects and then the output of these effects go back into the effects return of the amp1. Okay, it's a bit complicated but um, it's the same thing what I've done with the analog pedals. Just now everything is one housing and it's maybe a bit confusing but in this, it's the same thing. Guitar into the pre-effects which are input here, then it's the pre-effects Activate a loop after the pre-effects, the send will go into the input of amp1, then the output from, from amp1 goes into the return of that same loop from the HX effects, and then the output goes to the return of the amp1 effects loop. That's the way to, to dial this in. And by the way, this uh, can be done here on the HX effects with the signal flow. Here you see the different blocks and this is your loop. The HX effects offers two loops. So having two loops gives you two options. First option is to have the loop before you go the M, uh, to the amp1 um, or you have the amp1 in the first loop which means the second loop comes after the preamp that gives you an option of having another pedal in the HX effects if you're using the first loop on the HX effects the second loop on of the HX effects can give you another pedal but then this would be a post effect 
if you want to use another whatever boost pedal, your beloved Tube Screamer or Clone Clone or whatever, which you don't like from the digital world, you can have a pedal inserted here and that would go into loop one and then you would have loop two to bring in the amp one into the system. Wow, okay, that's a routing thing. What I'm saying here is you got all the options. It's pretty powerful. So thinking of a tiny little pedal board like this, I mean, the HXFX has about the same size like the M1 and that's <laughs> why it's such a nice combination. And it looks even cooler when you have one of those Iridium editions here. So it's black on black, but this is also really, really cool. Um, and of course, there are, we have a lot of users um, having HFX and the Iridium edition. So that is another nice match. Talking about this setup here, um, you can do a lot. Um, there is so many options. Let me show a very simple option. I press the home button and I'm be back on my bank one and this is by the way I'm using some proven life proven presets from my dear friend um, Horst Weber. Horst is the owner of the Kufsteiner Musikhaus, <laughs> Kufstein Austria. It's a it's a very uh, traditional town um, near the Alps. Um, this is actually when you come from Munich and the motorway crosses the border to Austria and this is where Kufstein is. And um, I play there like every second year uh, and then uh, it's always great to meet um, Horst at the Kufsteiner Musikhaus. And this is um, his own presets that um, he is using. I, I own this um, HX effects but um, I got my own pedal board and I have no time to tweak the sounds so I used his sounds and by the way you can download the sounds from Horst um, there's a link below and um, yeah feel free to use this as your starting point and then of course whatever guitar you use whatever your taste is you can tweak the, the presets but these presets actually do work so I arrange those with the Line 6 software and the software um, I have to say is it's a nice and comfortable software um, to load in presets and you can connect both units which means a computer with a software and uh, the HX effects with a standard USB cable to load in the presets um, so they talk to each other which is nice and um, you could also do it via MIDI, but I just did it with the USB cable. So this was kind of a convenient process. Um, the first sounds I'm using here is what Horst has programmed for himself, only using the clean channel of the M1. is using overdrive pedals from the HX effects. And he is deliberately not using the reverb from the HX effects because he prefers the one from the M1. And um, the good thing about that kind of setup is you can still use the switches on the M1. So you have your presets from the HX effects and you still have your reverb button on the M1 and your boost button. And in the worst case, you can even go to uh, another channel here. Um, worst case or whatever, if you like to do. So there's options, there's, there's more options than you think because um, the HX effects, is now changing only the internal presets and not changing the M1. Wow, 
What you hear now with this little glitch here, this has nothing to do with M1. M1 is not changing anything. This is changing programs in the HX effects. But Line 6 has thought of how to make um, program changes offer another option, which is like they have scenes. And these scenes mean that you have a preset and you change parameters within the preset and that is not giving you this kind of glitches. So there's always a trade-off, you know, if you go very, um, how you say, uh, extreme in having a full new preset, you have to be aware that the unit needs a little loading time and that's, you can't deal with that if you are picky, you hate it, I think for what it offers, it it's okay. It has nothing to do with M1. So, at the so that's kind of a, um, the first way how to deal with it. Now I have uh, engaged the boost of M1, and as you can hear, this is kind of a analog byte, which is like a. Gives the whole thing, yeah, something alive. Now let's switch to the second bank. And now we can see that when I switch presets here, the M1 is also switching the channels. And this is being done via MIDI. So the Line 6 HX effects offers a MIDI out. And we have to use one of our MIDI one adapters. And this is what we've got in the foot switch socket or the MIDI socket of the M1. And then the MIDI one adapter can receive MIDI program change commands. And these program change commands can be assigned to a setting of the M1 which is done by MIDI Learn. So your preset has a program number and once you press that number, that number can be memorized with the setting. So I programmed the whole amp because this is what you have to do when you get the presets. Um, there's a number, but the amp doesn't know what to do with it. So you have to learn the amp what to do with the preset. So what I had to do is like for the clean channel, I was setting the amp one to clean, and then um, I was press and hold the boost button. Maybe we can do this. Okay, I do clean, and then um, I, I go to another preset. So when I press the, the real preset, this will send the command. Okay, I press and hold the boost button. Now this should be start blinking, and once I press this, it stops blinking, and stop blinking means, oh, I learned the command. Now, this preset with this preset number always will recall my clean channel, how I set this. And I've done the same thing with the vintage channel, with the, with the classic channel and the modern channel. Very simple thing. And you can also learn if you like to have the, the boosts engaged and you can have the, the reverb on or off or what, what channel. There's a lot of options. Plus, there's the option of MIDI control, control changes uh, on the M1, which is um, CC7 uh, for master volume. There's 20 and 60. Ah, we have a full page, <laughs> um, which is now shown in the picture. Great. I don't know stuff by heart, but uh, as you can see, so the MIDI control change numbers seven is always a master volume, and the master volume is a range of minus 10 dB to 0 dB, which means um, we cannot go to no sound at all. It's just made for making a rhythm sound and a lead sound. And it's the same as we get when we use the remote one. It's now just coming from MIDI and the HX effects can actually give you this feature. You have to, to go on the MIDI page. Uh, we have a guest that will show you 
um, because he's the real expert. I just tell you about the, the basic stuff. Yeah, and the other program change, change numbers is um, like there is um, 20 and uh, 20 does gain. So you can dial in any kind of gain for any of the M1 channels. And that's another beauty because it gives you so much more sounds from the M1. And um, we have the power soak on CC30. And uh, yeah, the power soak kind of uh, limits the output power of the M1 and gets it into saturation at a lower volume level, if you like that. Some people believe I can't play without um, uh, the power soak. Um, I usually, I'm not using the power soak. I, I like the power soak because it's kind of the natural saturation of the power amp stage, but that's kind of always on 100. And it's kind of a smooth transition when it goes to 100 in, in the Mercury edition. And so it, there's already some kind of sagging going on, which is musical. And it's kind of widely spread over the power range. So, um, and by the way, it's different from the Iridium edition. The, the Iridium edition is more, is tighter in the, in the power amp stage. Um, so it has a different feel to it. You, you want a tighter, a bit stiffer, but tight, fat, uh, punchy rhythm sound with the Iridium. And you want a, a bit more sponginess in the M1 Mercury edition. So, of course, you can move that range to a lower wattage um, with the power soak, but I think that's a super expert kind of thing that can be used in certain situations. I offer that, but I think it's not like, um, because you know, I love Marshalls. Some of those Marshalls you would never play without a power soak because they are simply too fucking loud and they wouldn't sound at any lower volume than, you know, higher than five or at kind of the limit. But the M1 is designed to be nicely warm sounding at any level. So the power soak is just a plus for you. Yeah, so these are um, all the options we can um, get in the combination. And um, I will do a series of uh, four cable methods um, with different products from different brands and I will invite different people. Um, so you will see other products in some future episodes showing you what people do with whatever their Roland uh, and, and other um, devices. Let me check the questions. Um, I think we have some questions from last time. Oh, uh, Bülent Kömert. Okay, what a nice name. <laughs> Can we hear Les Paul on vintage channel via headphone out ACDC style? Thank you. Um, well, I can't do that, but uh, if if you if you listen to my last episode ep uh, where I played ACDC and we had this little short snippet out there, um, this is what you get because we were using the blue box and the blue box is very simpler, sim uh, uh, similar to the recording out. And you simply go onto the last episode with the um, ACDC and this is what you get. I ha even had a real uh, SG, uh, Gibson SG, and I was doing the AB comparison versus my 100 watt Plexi Marshall uh, on 10, everything kind of on 10, the real deal volume. And Amp1, I found was super close. Uh, actually, I couldn't tell which one I was playing. Um, so you can get that kind of sound uh, as you can hear it because that's direct what you hear on the YouTube video. Straight from, we use the blue box, um, but the recording out, I made many comparisons. Um, it's similar, it's not exactly the same. There are even some people that prefer the recording out to the blue box. Um, fair enough, it's all a matter of taste, but this shows me how good the 
the recording out sounds versus an IR loader like the Blue Box, where I spent half a year to get all the cabinets that I own in the best way captured for the IRs. Uh, and and this, this kind of recording out that offers only one sound is already that good that some people prefer that to the Blue Box. So um, it sounds pretty good. Okay, next question. Darren West, can you demo the fat cap and the nano cap settings on the blue box against your usual 4x12 settings? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, how close do they sound to the real caps? Um, let me show you the sounds. Um, okay, I'm on clean here. Let's play the vintage channel. <laughs> So this is my Stack 1970. This is the one that I always play with because it's my favorite cabinet, uh, which I recorded most of my albums with. Um, so now I go to the fat cap, which is the center of the, the blue box. <laughs> So the whole thing has a little ho 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 and that's something beautiful actually because I go back to the Stack 1970. The Stack 70 sounds so big which is great but some people complain about can I get a bit more focus in the mids and this is what the fat cap gives you. Back to the fat cap here. So the fat cap is the cabinet that I use on stage for, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years, maybe 12 years by now. Um, I designed that cabinet for myself, even for uh, the times where, back in the days when I was with Jusen Kettner and I wanted my cabinet. I was not too happy about what they offered and <laughs> I wanted my 4x12-ish sound in the 1x12 and then I I experimented with the with the fat cap. I, it, it's based on a Mesa Boogie till a small design, and then I tweaked the housing. I, I tried out different speakers. I used greenbacks a lot, and then I was killing the greenbacks and blah blah blah. In the end, um, my prototype became a blue guitar product, which is now the fat cap, and it's um, it's been proven over hundreds, maybe thousands of gigs. I don't know. And that's the sound. So, Stack 1970. Killer and Fat Cap. Maybe I bring the mic position in the middle. Fat cap simply works. It's a it's a it's a cabinet that's super. Hmm. It sounds like rock, but it also has the bl the bluesiness, and it works for clean tones. It's a, it's a nice all rounder, and it works for me as a rock guitar player. Okay, the nano cap is this one. Back to the fat cap. You can hear how much we get um, the low end from the fat cap. And the nano cap is kind of a bit more mid-rangey.
back to the fat cap. You can already hear this kind of 4x12-ish fullness. But some people don't need that. Some people want a bluesier, a mid rangier tone. And then it's great. Okay, yeah, cabinets, they are all different, they are all great and they are good for something. And it's a matter of taste and it's a matter of what you need. If you need a loud cabinet, um, the nano cap already is kind of loud, but of course it has its limits. And if you need more, a fat cap gives you a little bit more punch if you need that. And if you need even more, there's a twin cap and of course, in the end, you can use whatever you like. There's so many cabinets on the market. Um, but um, the Nano Cap is another great sounding cabinet, especially if you play smaller stages. And it's the smallest 112 cabinet. Still, there is. Okay, next question. Uh, Ray K, I got your Blue Strat by Vintage. Okay, uh, I like the sound and the fretboard. Is your own guitar as heavy as mine? Well, heavy. Um, they vary a little bit. Um, mine is normal. Um, maybe yours is a heavy one. Um, hard to tell. Um, I don't know how heavy yours is. Um, if it sounds good, it sounds good. If it's too heavy, um, let's put it that way. If the guitar is too light, the tone suffers. Um, and if it's too heavy, it's probably a great tone. Maybe not so easy to wear it all, all night. Um, it's a trade-off. Um, I can't compare because I don't have yours. Um, there are some tolerances, of course, but um, um, I hope it's not too ultra heavy and not made of stone. <laughs> okay, uh, Patrick Hess. Hi, Thomas. How often do you try new effects like shimmer reverb, etc.? Or are you just old school and you most you ever used? Um, I'm in between, to be honest. Um, of course, on the one hand, I have my taste and I like what I've got. And then, you know, I, I can have vibes and another vibe and another tape delay. And you know all that. Um, but to be honest, the Shimmer reverb also touched me. Yes. And there was a phase in my life where I was very much into experimenting with sounds. For those who know my first record and maybe remember me playing a rec stuff with some uh, rec devices, also um, the Quadraverb by Line 6. Was it Line 6? No, by Alesis. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> another American company. Um, and then I had some Digitech stuff and there they actually had some kind of... Um, you know, octave delays, I was using that. And I had some detuned delays that I was using as a scratching sound. If you go back to the 90s, I think in 1992 or three, I used those kind of sounds already. So it's nothing new to me. Um, I know Strymon is having a big time with the big sky with the Shimmer reverb and it's a great inspiring tool if you are into making soundscapes um, yeah i might come back for this in in the future um, i like it but i'm not using this at at the moment for myself okay um, cheers mm. so paul schlachter apropos uh, cable why is the blue guitar midi so expensive midi one uh, adapter it costs as much as one of those x y pedals as you showed last time. Well, it looks cheap, but I can, can only repeat myself. There's a PCB in this kind of um, five pole socket and there's super micro components, an optocoppler and a few other parts on the PCB. And this is a real metal thing. Um, and it's made in Germany. Sorry guys, made in Germany makes it more expensive than made in China. And uh, X5 pedals come from China direct. And this is um, 
you know, when the factor manufacturer can sell directly without having a brand, when the when the manufacturer is the brand, they save already one margin. And that's why X-Wife is as cheap as it can get. And therefore, I like to be involved in the project because you can get a good tone at the cheapest version possible in this industry. So if you get one of those X5 pedals, there is no cheaper way to do it. If you ask your technician friend to build you one pedal of that, even the components, when he goes into you know, one of those electronic stores and buys the components, it will cost at least the, the, the same amount like the finished product out of the box from X5. And then uh, he would spend hours and days to, to get the product done and count the hours doesn't work. It would be 200, 400, whatever bucks, euros or something uh, until this, this is, is made. So this is not only a cable, this is the MIDI One adapter interface. So our first prototype had an extra housing and of course, the extra housing would look impressive. It's like, I have such a big thing and it's very expensive because there's my housing and there's my components. But who wants to have an extra housing on a pedal board? You know, I'm about to design stuff that is as small as can be, as light as can be, and reduce it to the max. You know, this amplifier is so small because it's packed with 960 components. Um, and... You don't see it, but they are all necessary and they are nicely hidden under the hood and they do their work. And for some reason, I hope you understand why the product M1 costs the money that it costs. This is, we are not making money on this. It's not to rip you off, guys. This is just how it is if you have a real good, high quality metal, um, five pole DIN plug, an extra PCB, a few components and, and you, you make it in Germany and nobody's making real money on that. It's just something to make your life easier and it maybe does not look impressive so you don't see the money, but it's there. Okay, the value is there. Um, next question, Bob Baumeister, most uh, multi-effects devices have a miserable input stage. Yes, I do agree. Therefore, individual high-quality uh, high floor pedals are recommended. Yes, I know what you're talking about. And there is a little story about the HX effects from Line 6 and um, their loop quality. When Line 6 came out with this HX effects, we... Um, Jennifer Batten, for instance, uh, checked it out and she tried it, of course, with the M1 and she found a weird noise from the vintage channel or maybe the classic channel. And then um, she sent me sound files and we ended up by investigating the problem and we found that the analog stage that is in, in the Line 6 was not perfect. The good thing is we talked to Line 6 and because of us <laughs> here, we could make the Line 6, the, um, HX effect better for you guys. Not only the M1 was causing this um, weird noise, also some Vox M's that are open that have a lot of high end. Um, but the good news is Line 6 changed the design and all the new HX effects units are very, very good. So, of course, and he is right, um, the analog part is a delicate part because the signal is so low and so sensitive and you have to, to make a good design to keep the quality as high as possible. And um, some digital companies don't have that much knowledge. Line 6 they should have because they design also some guitar amplifiers and uh, yeah, that's pretty okay now. Okay, next question. Eric uh, Bosma, what settings do you recommend for the output input level of the HX effects and the sensitivity of the amp one. I noticed a lot of volume and tone difference, but never found a very usable setup. Okay, um, 
when you go to the signal flow, wait a minute, uh, you can, where was it? I'm not the, the, the big expert. Let's put it that way. The, the loop can be switched. Um, uh, the loop can be switched, go home. Let me see here, control uh, command center, signal flow. Ah, loop one. And the loop one, um, I can I can have um, a line level or I can have an instrument level. And of course, it needs to be on instrument level because we are going to the instrument input of amp1. First thing, very important. Secondly, you can um, you can dial in a level, and the level should be like unity gain, like guitar straight into amp1 or guitar with everything on bypass through the HX effects should be the same level, the same volume or the same gain, unity gain. So that's that's the thing. Talking about the effects loop, I tried um, the line setting. Um, for some reason, I came back to the instrument um, instrument uh, level. Then I had both loops on the same level, and uh, the amp one has this beautiful switch on the bottom. Um, it works both ways with the amp one, and I used the line six on instrument for, um, and it simply worked and it sounded good. So that's my recommendation. But instrument is important and unity gain is important. Okay, this can be dialed in with the HX effects. Um, oh, Luz, Luis P. Android. Um, okay, that's probably an artist name for a, a computer freak. Hi Thomas, in which position is AMP1 reverb when four cable method is used? Before post uh, external effects or after post external effects? Um, ha, the the reverb of AMP1 is actually at the output of the preamp, and it's kind of uh, is before the effects loop, and therefore you have the reverb being sent to the post effects of your multi effects. Um, it is not the super traditional way, but it works, and in any case, you still have reverb from your multi-effects device. So you can have reverb on reverb if you like that. So we have options. Okay, next question. Aaron Short Music. Uh, that rings a bell. Aaron Short Music. Um, anyway, is there a way to use iOS apps such as uh, Thu app in 4 cable using an audio interface? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> that. Okay, um, this I think you are talking about some like smartphone apps um, uh, for macOS or iOS. Um, I'm not familiar with this. Um, sorry, I don't know. Um, but it's something worth looking into. Um, Darren West, can you demo the nano cap and the fat cap uh, preset? Blue box, we did that already. Um, the next question. Um, Alpha Kanal, that's a very Deutsch, <laughs> Kanal with K. What kind of guitar box does the record out simulate? The record out on the M1 is, I would call it a universal guitar box that sounds good for overdrive and clean tones. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, there's a thinking of, I can't play clean tones only. I can play, play clean tones only on open back combos. Anything else down, does sound shit. Well, if you use our recording out and you use that kind of sound, it doesn't sound shit. And the, the box that I kind of modeled was something like my fat cap, which is kind of a universal cap that gives me the punch of the rock uh, bottom end that I know from 4 by 12s but also sounds funky and um, yeah sparkly enough for clean tones and it's not dull or anything it's very alive and so the recording out is something in between a fat cap and it's a universal cap and um, we have a Dutch uh, user um, 
the Dutch guitar dude, uh, Eric, um, and he wrote in the post the other day that he even preferred the recording out over the blue box. And um, that tells me the quality must be good. And secondly, he's probably coming from um, uh, an open back background. And there's a beauty about all that of that. Anyway, the recording out is pretty impressive, especially in a live situation. In the studio, I would say go for it if you like it. If not, use a blue box and you have more options to, to find your place in the mix and find a cabinet that kind of perf makes your, your clean or whatever sound uh, perfect sitting in the mix. So that's the way. Um, next question, Mr. Android again. Would you recommend M1 as a power amp for amp sim simulators like XFX connecting with the right, um, right into uh, M1 return? Well, you can do that, no problem. And there's nothing wrong about the X effects. Um, and the M1 power amp, I was um, showing you earlier in some earlier episodes, is like a tube power amp. I mean, just talking about the nanotube power amp in the M1 is, uh, I think, uh, a little sensation because it weighs nothing. It's two pounds and it's a hundred watt a nanotube power amp um, and of course it pairs well with an H uh, or XFX or any kind of um, amp simulator if you prefer simulated amp sounds versus real amp sounds. My personal preference is I like those digital devices for the effects and I prefer the analog amp sounds. Um, but hey, we are all different animals. If you like a simulated amp sound because it's making you happy and it has the right of compression and whatever, use this as a power amp and you will see that your processor will come alive. I've, I've tried it uh, with campers, I've tried it with uh, H, uh, the XFX by the way uh, and other um, processors and the M1 power amp stage makes it, there's nothing like it only if you have a real tube power amp stage on this market. And tube power amp stages, there's nothing wrong about it, but they're just too fucking heavy. Who needs another 20 kilograms or 15 uh, for, for, for such a big power amp? Uh, for me, that's not convenient. So yeah, check it out. Amp1, use the return. There's a little sensitivity switch on the button. I can show you here. Oops. And oh, this is a, a nice tweaked unit. Um, this, this little thing here, there's a switch inside, a push-push button. And this will switch from um, plus 4 dB to minus 10 dB. Minus 10, by the way, is the instrument level. And uh, plus 4 is like studio level. So depending on your processor, you could probably use the line level and switch this to the plus 4 dB uh, section. Okay. Um, last question. Alex Martins. How to set an EQ pedal with Blue Guitar Amp Silver Edition to get Blue Guitar Amp 1 Mercury Edition? Ah, well, um, it is actually you would need more than a EQ pedal. Um, but of course you can get closer from the M1 Silver Edition, from the first one to the Mercury, when using an EQ pedal. Um, I would use a little roll down of the bass, so which means you would reduce 60 hertz and maybe a touch of 100. So you, 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 get, you, you make a, a little less low end. Um, that's one aspect that would come closer, but hey, we changed so many things. We changed um, a lot of different little details inside every channel. So, um, but try that. I mean, that's, that's maybe the most obvious uh, thing that you will easily notice when you have a little less bass from the input uh, into the stages. Um, but there is more. I changed 
the, the three band tone control, I change every channel by itself. The clipping is, is, is changed. Uh, yeah, you, it's, not that, it's not that simple. But hey, feel free, use an EQ pedal. Well, maybe you've seen my episode with Eddie Van Halen with the brown sound. And this was showing you that an EQ pedal turns a Marshall into a different animal. And that's what you need um, to, to create newer sounds. And that's something you could do with the EQ pedal and any amp. And of course with the silver edition. And that will get you a little bit towards the um, Mercury edition, but only a little bit. Okay, um, next question, Alex Martins. Why don't you make a tube preamp like Laney? Haha, <laughs> AMT um, accelerator with the power uh, nanotube. I could do many proj uh, projects, but uh, Blue Guitar is a small company that is focused on a few things and um, we can't do everything, even though if I had all these beautiful ideas. So my, my next project is the MX and then we see what comes after that. Um, um, yeah, and here in the AMP1 you have already kind of tube preamp and it's all there in a way. Um, but of course there's other, other products on the market and they are also great, okay? Um, next question, Johnny Favorite. Favorite. I'm curious about the speakers in your boxes too, especially the twin cap. How do they compare to super light matrix cap with neo speakers and the vintage 30s in the new light bare-faced twin guitar cap? Okay, ah, you know, I would love to talk about cabinets a lot more. The biggest problem for me is I can't do this on the live stream because cabinets produce so much volume and it's so hard to capture the sound of a cabinet um, you know, in a room. We should have a studio to do that and maybe that's something we will do in the future. It's on my wish list to have a place where we can, like a studio, we go in the studio and we will shoot a, a, a huge cabinet um, episode or maybe two comparing our cabinets to other cabinets, other speakers, blah, blah, blah. I have a huge collection of speakers in the room behind me. I am crazy. I collected every speaker that I liked over the years and uh, people hate me for having this many speakers, but I do have original 1966 green bags, two of them. And I have, you know, black bags. I have, I have even unused black bags, spare, spare from the 70s, original packaging I found in music stores and stuff like that. I have 65s, I have, ah, you name it. I have, you know, cream bags, the new stuff as well, the old stuff and Jensen's and scum bags and blah, blah, blah. So back to your question, neo speakers. I think neo speakers is kind of a nice topic. But at this point, I haven't found a neo speaker that I personally was so convinced that I would use it. I can see the, the direction is getting to the right, uh, it's getting there in, in a way, but it's not yet there. I'm working kind of on a neo project as well for over a year and it it's not finished because I'm not happy. <laughs> so maybe one day we can see Blue Guitar Neo speakers as well, but only when it's ready. And um, I've found some promising bits and I found some bits that I'm not happy with yet. So it might take whatever time, at least a year, maybe two, maybe five. Um, you never know because I know how it should sound to my ears and it's not there yet. Um, how do they compare to the speakers that I have? The, talking about a twin cap, in Europe we have a, a twin cap Mark II and, a, and worldwide we see the twin cap Mark I. Um, talking in terms of traditional speakers that you know, um, the Mark I is a very strange animal. It's using 
I would say uh, G1275 style speakers. It's not the same thing, but just some something in that direction. But in serious wiring, and that makes the whole cabinet sounding not too bright. This makes the whole cabinet sounding warm and big and sonore in a way. And um, then we have our new Twin Cab Mark II, only available in Europe um, as a limited uh, production run. And that's using more kind of V30 type speakers. I try to get rid of the too much sizzle of a V30. And this is using a different uh, speaker from the Twin Cap Mark I and also in parallel wiring. And this makes the cabinet a lot tighter and a lot more in your face for those metal guys that want that. The Mark I is, I think, both cabinets have their beauty. Um, the Mark I is, is, to me, it's, it's, it's a bit bigger, it's a bit more vintage, but some metal guys even like that. I mean, it makes your sound like fat ass, you got something in your hand, warm. Um, but the Mark II is a cabinet that, that is faster, more in your face, and that's another character. So, <laughs> you know, um, Wow, I have my personal preferences, but um, it's hard to describe. The best is you plug into a speaker and you play it. And the even best is you play it with a band, then you know what, what time it is. The only thing I can tell you about our blue guitar cabinets is they are lightweight. They, the wood is uh, a special construction, um, multiplex layer wood, and it has a, a reduced thickness to save the weight and we have like bracings to stabilize the whole cabinet so it's still tight um, and it's as small and as lightweight as it can be for what it is you know there's a nano cap there is no smaller cabinet with 112 with a single 12 uh, inch speaker than the nano cap and there's a fat cap there's still a 112 and there's i think not a bigger sounding 112 out there um, at least not in this kind of direction that is still versatile for clean and overdrive. Of course, I can do a, a cabinet that is only chong chong chong, but then there's no great clean anymore. I have a, a universal cabinet that has a tendency to be more rock 4 by 12 ish but does all the rest, and that's the fat cap. And then the twin cap, Mark I, is even another step bigger and more headroom because of the two speakers, if you need that. Of course, it's bigger and it's a bit heavier because of the two speakers, but the, the housing is reduced and it, I can still put that in my car easily. It's a gigable cabinet. I played some beautiful sounding cabinet by other brands, but I, I am too old to get them up the stairs. I, that's too heavy. Sorry, guys. That's uh, for me not practical anymore. Um, so I'm a gigging guy and I know I want to be on stage not being fucked up. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I do small amplifiers and lightweight cabinets. Wow, we have so many questions today. Um, Eric uh, Bosma again. I have seen your demo to compare the amp one versus real amps. Can you publish your settings? Um, actually, we did on a few. Um, some of them, um, I didn't take any notes. Uh, that's unfortunately. Um, but we have some, I think in, in, in some earlier episodes here on the live streams, we, we actually posted pictures of that. You should see them or look at the overhead uh, cameras. When I did Stevie Ray Vaughan, when I did Queen, when I did uh, Van Halen, all that stuff should be somewhere in the videos. Um, okay, it's a good hint, and yes, you are right, I should make notes, and we should make an archive of all these great sounds. Um, yeah, but busy, 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 and sometimes I forget. Okay, thanks for reminding me, um, but there is some stuff online. Okay, next, um, Osmium Studios, okay, whatever that is. How your Iridium Edition compares with 5150, also Will you make Iridium cabinets for Metal Guy? Yes. Um, well, 5150 and the modern channel of the Iridium is kind of in the same ballpark. It's not 
100% exactly the same amp, but it's very much in the same ballpark. So if you know what a 5150 is, and if you play the modern channel on the Iridium, you're probably there. Um, and there are some tweaking options with the custom controls. Um, and the 5115 is a tight high gain amp that has a, a very typical um, yeah, sound and attack. And I think that's the, the modern on the Iridium too. Um, will you also make Iridium cabinets for metal guys? Well, try a twin cap Mark II. That's probably uh, a metal cabinet for metal guys. <laughs> At least it's an offer to you guys with some of the most in your face blue guitar speaker cabinets ever, if you like that. And it's, it's metal. It's definitely metal. Um, try it out. So, uh, Lars Dreimann, can you use IR on the HX? Um, you have, um, I think you have a problem here. I'm not so familiar with the H effects. Um, the IRs that are loaded into the H effects, um, if we use the stereo output, there might be an option to, 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 to get that in there, but I don't know. I don't know because I haven't tried. Please contact some of the Line 6 HFX users. And we do have a group on Facebook where people about um, talk about Line 6 HFX, where, they, where there is actually an M1 HFX user group. And um, they are happy to share that knowledge, which I don't can, cannot provide. And we have a guest in a minute that will give you even more insight into that. Okay, what's the next question? Because there are too many questions. Um, Lure le, le, strange, okay, whatever. Maybe a stupid question from a new M1 user, but why did you choose not to place a trim pot for volume and tone in vintage mode of the M1 Iridium? Well, there is no um, tone on any of M1's vintage channel because the vintage channel to me is like the center of the universe. It's the channel that goes from overdri overdrive to clean. It's already overdriven, but it has also the right frequency spectrum that it can clean up and does this. And then all the other control controls, the tone controls, like bass mid treble and the custom controls kind of should match to that vintage channel. That's the way I designed the M1 family. And that's the same with Mercury or Iridium Edition. And um, other ways, you, you, it's, it's like kind of chasing moving targets. You would change the vintage channel uh, tone and then you change that tone control again. It's, um, it will never end. Having a vintage reference tone in the amp and then assign the other channels to it makes your life a lot easier. That's my answer for that stupid question. <laughs> okay, so um, these are the questions for today. And um, I have to talk about my dear guest, which is Dr. Nathan McFarlane from Nashville, who is a Line 6 HFX user um, that I met in Nashville. And yeah, um, he has uh, put out uh, a few very nice videos and he has much more knowledge about the HF effects than I do because he has like a Line 6 history, so he knows even previous products. And um, talking about Nashville, I usually go there like every year and it's so great to meet people there. Um, I met, uh, uh, the strangest kind of things happen there. There's like Johnny Highland, you know, the country guy, and there's Justin Johnson, um, who is a, a unique uh, picker guy who he invited, uh, invites me like every year to his enormous house and we have a hang and we drink his whiskey and we jam. You know, when I go there, I'm totally jet lagged, but uh, it, it's so cool. And last time, you know, we had a jam uh, at, at his fireplace. And then in the end, uh, I asked who else was, was uh, joining in. 
Yeah, that was the guitar player from the Jackson 5 and myself and Justin. Hey, we had so much time. And here in this picture, you can see George Groon on the bottom. The famous Mr. George Groon, he invented, you know, vintage guitar business. He was the first one selling old used guitars in Nashville. And he is like Mr. Vintage himself. Um, in the middle, you can see um, 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 Amanda, the blonde girl, is the daughter of Paula Jo Taylor. Paula Jo, jo Taylor um, is a Nashville-based um, country and rock uh, granny. And I made her famous by accident because I made a little video when she was trying out the M1 on a, on a Telecaster. And it was so cool um, that I thought, I have to film this lady. And I filmed her with my iPhone. I put it on our Facebook page. And Nikki Six from Metal Crew saw it on our Facebook uh, page, and then he was using it on some kind of um, TV program and made some funny jokes about it. You know, this granny really shreds. I mean, I can burn my guitar now and stuff like this. And then she became uh, a sensation on 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 YouTube. And then, um, <laughs> yeah. And in the end, she was even inviting me to join in to play on. Um, um, on Broadway um, to, to join on with the band and yeah this was so much fun and I had even um, a friend of mine uh, Christoph Kemper you know the Mr. Kemper from Kemper M's he joined in as a keyboard player because he was just you know he saw me walking out the, uh, the, the, the show going there what are you doing and I said oh I go there and this, this was so fucked up so he thought okay we have to do this because it's so much fun. Nashville is so much fun. It's the music city of, of the United States and maybe the world. Um, yeah, please welcome Mr. Nathan McFarland and watch the next, whatever, 50 minutes. <laughs> so, Dr. Nathan McFarland from Nashville, Tennessee. What a pleasure to have you on our live stream here in Germany. <laughs> and um, I've been talking a little bit about the, the basics of the four cable method, but before we start and go into details, I would like to know a little bit more about your background. I mean, Nashville, Tennessee, that is the music town of the world, maybe? <laughs> of the so, whole entire so, so, world, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I noticed so many people move um, lately to Nashville, you know, like Larry Card moved to Nashville, and mm -hmm. uh, I've been there a couple of times, and it's, it's such an, a live scene. But hey, let us know a little bit about your background. Um, what, what are you doing? I, you have a studio, you work for Gibson, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, so I came to Tennessee, uh, not really knowing I'd ever end up here, back in the early 2000s. Um, I had just finished up uh, community college, which is a two-year degree program at a uh, right. school in Alabama. Studied jazz and played guitar in a big big band jazz kind of setup on scholarship there. That was a fun experience. And then I was looking around the different schools. Um, I even looked at Florence, Alabama, because they had a good uh, commercial music kind of program over there. And then I looked at Belmont and realized that even the bowl of cereal that I ate was way too expensive. <laughs> so I found... <laughs> Um, not, 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 that's not a knock on Belmont, but you know, a lot of people can't afford that place. So I ended up finding MTSU, which is in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and that's about 30 minutes south of Nashville. And they had a recording program, excellent music school. Um, I was in a, a commercial music ensemble there playing, you know, mm -hmm. just playing covers of like rock tunes and learning how to be in a band and. Um, all that kind right. of stuff. So, uh, and I had been in bands in high school, just playing around with friends. But this was a uh, a more structured uh, way of like, hey, here's a list of songs. Let's figure out how to play the parts and play together as a group and stuff like that. And uh, yeah. so I basically went there uh, another three years, and I played trombone in the marching band because I played trombone wow. since seventh grade. Um, which is interesting because when I hold a trombone, I can read bass clef. 
But when I hold a guitar, <laughs> okay. I can read treble clef. But when I try to do wow. either one, it's like my mind gets weird. So <laughs> okay, so you can read. That's cool. Yeah, but I can let read me music know about this. Um, yeah, th th there's a, like a Nashville notation where you kind of mm -hmm. uh, just notate uh, like the function of the chord, a one chord, a four chord, yeah. a five, a six chord. So is this is, is this the way you you do it? Yeah, this is uh, this is the way I teach uh, my private lessons. Okay. I mean, I can teach mm -hmm. reading as well, like music notation. But yeah. the, the Nashville number system all yeah. are, all originated in the studio because let's say for example you had a sheet uh, a piece of paper with like you know a C chord a G chord an F chord you know whatever, and then the yeah. singer comes in and says, "Hey guys." You you sound my great, is, but the but the key is all wrong. Yeah. I need it low, lower or higher for my voice. Higher. Yeah. And usually you'd have to rewrite all the actual note names on the page because yeah. as a musician you don't want to see a G chord but be thinking yeah. of a whole step like the A or whatever. So yeah. when you start representing the notes or chords in a key with a number. Now that number is universal, so it applies to all yeah. 12 half steps in a chromatic scale. So yeah. now when I see a one and I'm in the key of G, I'm going like, to be like, all right, one is G, four is C, yeah. five is D. C, and when I D. change keys up to like A or B flat, let's just go B flat for yeah. instance. Yeah. Now B flat is one, E flat is four, yeah. F is five. Yeah. And I don't have to Correct. do that yeah. switch in my head. I can yeah. just think of a different key and be like, all right, I'm good. So I love yeah. I love natural number system. It's great for developing your ear because you can listen to yeah. the radio with your favorite record and be like, all right, that's a one chord, that's a six minor chord, that's a two minor, that's a four, that's a five, stuff like that. So yeah, um, yeah I wish everyone knew at least a little bit about natural number system because it would make my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm self-taught and the funny thing is uh, because I learned by ear, mm -hmm. so uh, it, it, I came up with something similar because that's the only way it really makes sense. Otherwise, right. you know, if you writing new charts for every song doesn't make any sense, you know, yeah. it's a waste of paper time. And uh, what about, you told me that you worked for Gibson for a while? Yeah, this was... Uh, uh Obviously, we had internet back then, but we still had ads in the paper kind of thing. And uh, after I graduated MTSU, um, I was looking around, calling studios, because I had just finished up an internship I had a, at a pretty high-end studio here in Nashville. And I realized, he's like, hey, this is going to take a lot more work just to get my foot in the door and be a, like a real engineer kind of thing. So... I was looking yeah. in the newspaper, which people don't really do a whole lot nowadays. We all Google things <laughs> and whatever else. But yeah, sure. I was looking through the classifieds and saw that Gibson was hiring just for like general labor kind of stuff. So I was like, all right, well, I'll go over there and check it out. And ended up working in the rough mill for about 10 years. And I started out on the next side, shaping the next, cutting out the headstock, running the CNC machine. And then I moved over to the body side, which literally I drive a, a forklift, unload all the trucks, bring the wood mm -hmm. in, plane it, chop it down to whatever length it needs to be for like body stock, neck stock, uh, learn mm -hmm. how to glue the bodies together, put the tops on, all that stuff. So that was a really fun experience. And uh, if you ended up getting a bad Gibson, it's not my fault. Okay, I just chopped the wood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, and if you have a good Gibson, it's your fault too because that's right, yeah. <laughs> you you made a perfect shape. Sure. Hey, that, yeah. that's cool. Um, when when I, uh, you know, I usually come to Nashville like for every summer NAM, mm -hmm. and then um, I find this as a, as a very uh, good show, a great show, because it's like not as big as the NAMM show in Los Angeles. Right. And uh, and it's it's like more guitar focused and um, people are more relaxed. They are not so shiny. I have to 
be the superstar, you know, like Hollywood, uh, Los Angeles is kind of, uh, yeah, everybody tries to be a star. Right. And in Nashville, everybody is more or less relaxed. So, yeah. you know, I got invited to, to, to some jams and, you know, getting really easy in contact with local players. And I was actually amazed when I heard how many studios there are in town, how many musicians there are. Yeah. It's unbelievable. You literally, you and, literally uh, just drive down the road, and you could pass like ten studios without even knowing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I went to a place. It, it used to be a church, and they kind of uh, transferred it into a studio. And then mm -hmm. there was a jam going on, and it was killer. And uh, of course, um, you know, me being German, we have a different musical background. Um, you know, we we are more grown up on. British classic rock and maybe pop music in a way. But when you come to Nashville, I, 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 first I thought I could hear many different genres of music. But the typical thing in Nashville for me is like, you can um, go on the street, somebody has a trolley with a Fender twin and a Telecaster <laughs> around his neck, you know? Yeah. It's like and maybe a, a cowboy hat because it's so fucking hot mm -hmm. and humid. And this will never happen here in Germany. And then when, when you see the guys play, this is what I learned in, from Nashville, is like play a G chord and you just bend. Yeah. You bend the low, the low E string to, to get that kind of... Uh... Right, yeah, I'm not it. that good at it yet. But yeah. Yeah, but th that's the thing. I've never heard before any other place, and um, yeah, study yeah. Uh, study up on some Johnny Cash, and you'll have it you'll have it down. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I know there's a lot of different genres of music out there in Nashville. What 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 yeah. did you come across in your studio times, or what did you do? I mean, mainly here in my studio, I work with individual singers. Uh, there's a, a finger style guitar player named Lance Allen that you really need to check out. He's excellent. Mm -hmm. but he's he's known as he's known as the king of Spotify because he does really well on Spotify. But uh, okay. check him out. Uh, I worked with a lot of bands. You know, either I worked with a in the last year alone, I worked with some country a country group, a rock group. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done rap and hip hop over the years. Um, it's not my preference, but you know, I can. It's music, yeah, sure. so I can work with anything. And um, yeah, sure. I mean, I hadn't really done anything like too eclectic. I'm working with a uh, a friend, a vocalist named Donna Allison, and uh, mm -hmm. we're doing Christmas music together. So we're preparing for the mm -hmm. Christmas season, and we've got like eight songs recorded so far, and we're going for twelve. So we got a few more left mm -hmm. to do on that. So it's just. You name it. I mean, we we work on a little bit of everything here. So, um, if it's music, it can be if it can be considered music, we do it. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. So, by the way, same here. When I was in my late teenage years, I was hired as a session guy um, to Heidelberg. Heidelberg is kind of a tourist town here in Germany, mm -hmm. where all the American tourists come. So they recorded a. a, a, a Back then, I think it was a CD or vinyl, Memories of Heidelberg. And it was about <laughs> 28 German classic country songs. And I had to fake stuff because I couldn't bring a banjo. So I was playing my electric guitar, miking it up and oh, weird shit like that. Yeah. But uh, sticking, a, um, sticking a piece of paper under the bridge and through the strings so it kind of mutes the strings yeah. and stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that kind of things. Uh, but I mean, you know... If you get a, a good job, it's always a challenge. You know, I learned from every little job I've done, no matter what music it was. And even if it's a bad experience, I learned something. <laughs> yeah. You got to take it all into consideration, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, what is this? your story about the Line 6 HX effects? I saw some videos online. And um, you seem to be super familiar with it. So for me, for my side is, okay, the Amp 1 uh, is my baby. And um, yeah. I, I gave it, so to speak, a MIDI and an effects loop. 
so the basic switching can be done like channel switching, like boost and on and off, on and off, like reverb on and off, and a few things uh, with control changes, which is like um, master volume gain and so on. Well, let me see. That's on our instruction manual page, eighty nine. Oh, good. 89. Um, that's what I was, maybe that's where I was looking 89. for. <laughs> yeah, uh, 89 is the English side. Yeah, there's, uh, the, the booklet is, um, the first part is German, the second one is English. 89 is the magic number. So yeah. this is where you see all the, the, the CC commands. And the big printing says MIDI receive channel, channel is number one. Um, yeah. So I try to keep it as simple as possible. And um, because I know MIDI and this kind of stuff, you know, also for cable method is kind of a complex thing. You have to understand what you're doing. And most guitar players are not that passionate, uh, patient, sorry. They are pa passionate, but pa not so patient sometimes when it right. comes to technical stuff. And um, yeah, um, so I try to keep the amp one side as easy as possible, just providing a MIDI learn kind of thing, so uh, you press, you, you plug in our MIDI adapter, there's a MIDI 1 adapter, and then you mm -hmm. press and hold the boost button, the reverb um, LED ring will blink, and then it's waiting for a program change number to come in, and when there's a, a particular number coming in, it will stop blinking and it will memorize it forever. So every time this number comes into the M1, it will recall the settings they have been set to before. Right. So that's as easy as I could uh, do it. And you know it's and, uh, working CC, when you know it's working when the blinking stops like almost immediately. If it just keeps blinking yeah. and blinking, you like you know something's not right. It's like okay, what's what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but when you work a little bit uh, with with the M1 and some other MIDI device like the HX FX, mm -hmm. um, you get a feel for it. You know, yeah. At the, the, every beginning is kind of a bit bit strange. Yeah, here's one of those uh, MIDI one adapters for yeah. the camera, so you can see. Um, and some people complain about it; it would be too expensive. But there's actually an optocoupler in there. There's some other parts because. There is a whole uh, tiny MIDI interface on that side of the Dean uh, five pole uh, side. Right. The other side is just a, a quarter inch plug. So we had someone with uh, bigger plugs uh, in case you want to change that to an angled one like that or right. whatever uh, suits you best. Simply cut the wire and have uh, any kind of quarter inch plug that goes into the M1. That's the MIDI one adapter. Yeah, I almost changed um, my uh, my cable because I had I still have the straight yeah. end on mine, and the way it fits in the case, I like it, it works fine. So I don't I'm not going to modify mine at all. I'm just going to keep it the same because um, it works. Sure. It works great. I mean, it, yeah, pedal boards is is like every pedal board is an individual thing. You know, mm -hmm. it depends on what kind of pedals you are using and how you want to set them up and what's your wiring and where's some room and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, sometimes it's okay to, to, it's okay to modify at that end of the, of the MIDI one, not the other side. Right, right, right. And then, yeah, of yeah. Course, Don't cut off the MIDI end. Don't do that. <laughs> no, no, no. You, 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 can, you can look inside, but there's extra uh, some, some kind of hot glue on it to protect the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So you will, will see just a, a bulb of uh, glue on, on a little PCB that is inside that thing. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, let me yeah. tell you, let me um, tell you my, a little history with me in line six. Um, cause there, yeah, sure. there's a natural progression of how I got to the HX effects. Um, so mm -hmm. back in my college days, I was, uh, you know, playing in a worship band at church and I had the green line six DL four, which is just the delay ah. type effects, yeah. right? There's like the purple that's yeah. modulation and the yellow that's distortion, whatever. But I had the green one yeah, and mm -hmm. it has a auto volume echo sound on it that naturally mm -hmm. like you know swells into your notes and stuff you Bolts don't have to use a uh, you don't have to use a volume pedal with it volume. 
Yeah, or and, control here. Yeah. And ever since I found that effect, I had to have some kind of Line Six <laughs> product on my board because I had I love that sound. So, mm -hmm. but the problem with the DL4 is the switches were always bad, and they were all, you know it was just the they come loose and stop working, and you know they were just notorious for not being that well built. Um, so the mm -hmm. M series came out a few years later with the M13, M9, M5, and I had all three right. of those yeah. at one point. Um, mm -hmm. When the, the actual uh, the board I toured with, I toured Germany and, and uh, the rest of the Europe with in my band Feedback Revival, <laughs> I had an M9. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I had an M5, which is just a single. Right. It's one of the single units that it has, you know, a lot all the presets, but you can only use one sound at a time. And I was right. using uh, the bank up and down to get to like a volume pedal and a tremolo and the auto volume echo sound. Uh, cause, you know, because once you understand your set list and what songs you're playing, you don't really need that many effects. You know, you just kind of need whatever you need for the moment. Um, right. And then. I even had the M5 modded to upgrade the switches because I knew the switch would go out eventually. Um, okay. But but, the, but then when the HX effects came out, it has these capacitance switches. Like if you see on my camera here, you can see like how they switch. Let me go. Yeah. Uh, you just touch the switch and it now selects that switch. And you cannot right. do that on the M series or any of the other pedals. It's like that's amazing. And the, just the, mm -hmm. the whole quality of the HX effects is a huge step up from anything step else up. they've ever yeah. released. So when that came yeah. out, I'm like, this is, this, the HX effects pretty much replaced my whole analog board. So okay. I had the Boss ES8, I had all my pedals mm -hmm. lined up, ready to go on the board, and I was just about to start mm -hmm. running all the wires and power supply. And I was like, you know what, this is too big of a board i wasn't playing in my band anymore and i was just doing studio stuff and right. i was like i just need something small that has all the sounds i would ever need <laughs> mm -hmm. and the hx was perfect because for like 500 bucks what else are you gonna get for 500 bucks that has every single effect as that yeah. line six has ever come out with and by the right. time you go buy a compressor that's 100 bucks and yeah, uh, sure. a few overdrives. Overdrive yeah, it's like it's yeah. gonna add up very quickly. So for five hundred yeah. bucks, it's like, look, just buy the HX effects and be done with it. You know, you don't really need anything else yeah. as far as effects goes. Uh, that's just my sure. how my mind works. Because in the studio, you want to be able to get sounds quickly, and yeah. the HX can definitely do that for you. So that's how I got to the HX effects, and then when mm -hmm. I saw that. Uh, you know, when I met you last summer at the uh, NAM show, right? And yeah. uh, and I had seen the the amp one before, uh, but there's something you know meeting the actual creator of an amplifier and be like, <laughs> hey, this this guy's actually really cool, and he's an excellent player, and he's really down to earth, and just loves all things gear and tone and everything, just like me. I mean, you you yeah. give me you talk to me for ten minutes, so I'm not gonna. I cannot mention a guitar or an amp or a pedal or whatever else because that's just yeah, what yeah. I do. Um, yeah. So now combining the HX and the amp one together, it's like you get an excellent amplifier and you get all the effects you've ever wanted all on the same board. And right. what else would you want? You know. No, it's. I mean, this this is like a a, a perfect match mm -hmm. if you want to have um, a, a system that is flexible. That can memorize settings, you know. This is kind of best of both worlds: analog amp, nanotube, and then right. digital effects, and then the four cable method with effects in front of it, effects in the effects loop, um, and uh, you know the X HX effects has some options for whatever external expression pedals, mm -hmm. and you you can kind of decide yourself how far you go, you know, if yeah. you just have a few presets or if you go cr crazy with banks and extra controllers and whatnot. So there's, uh, 
yeah, it's. It, I think it's. And the other thing, what what makes it so so great, it's about the same size too. You know, they they yeah. kind of physically even match together. And I'm also excited about that, like the side where my power supply is is at. You know, where the where the mains go in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not disturbing um, the H effects. You know, first I was afraid, like if if I put both units too close. It could have some interference or anything. No, right. it simply works. Yeah, it simply super, works. So, it's a very quiet setup and no noise at all. So it's great. Yeah. And uh, there's one thing about the uh, Line 6 first version when they just came out with the HX effects. Some people had the problem um, that uh, the sound was a bit fuzzy, funny oh, yeah. with like the overdrive yeah. channels, uh, vintage or classic on the Amp1. And uh, I got noted uh, about this phenomena by Jennifer Batten. And, oh, good. Uh, okay. She, she, yeah, I mean, she called me up because we are kind of buddies connected through everything. She was my first customer of the M1 ever, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah. and, and she, yeah, you know, we, we, we go along, along a long way. And then she said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to use this new Line 6 thing. But something sounds weird and she made some recordings and finally we found that there was an issue, a hardware issue on the Line 6 and we, uh, we told Line 6 what to do and it was not only with the Amp1. I could show video that some Vox amps were doing it. Right. It's just about some amps that have um, a very open sound design when you combine like um, unfiltered gain like a Vox or like my vintage channel which is gain and high end at the same time this is the critical thing and there was kind of some oscillation going on they changed their hardware and now it's spot on yeah. it, it's absolutely working fine the only thing you have to know that you uh, set the loops in the H effects um, to the uh, instrument Kind of uh, right, yeah. Setting. You don't want to yeah. be line input because it'd be way too hot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like so, to think of the so, gain on the amp one as unbridled, unbridled gain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Release the beast, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean, for me, it's about being real. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if I have the whole range of frequencies and the whole range of dynamics and the whole range of gain from zero to maximum, this is what that's that's my kind of uh, creed or my kind of um, goal in amplifiers. I, you know, I I, I I mean, I don't mind if somebody just likes the clean channel and does it. But if I want uh, an amp designed for myself, I want to offer that, and I wanted no compromise. You know, right. and I've been working on projects where you had to compromise, but this was not with my logo on it. <laughs> you know, but when you grow older, right. it's hard to make compromises. And, and so I'm striving for, give me that thing. I want the real deal. Here's all my marshals. And that's my reference. You know, I'm, I'm not happy with anything that is not the ultimate reference. And then that's my goal. Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah. So what did you find out about the combination of the two that you have to watch with uh, the HX effects. So, so the first thing is um, the four cable method is pretty easy oh, yeah. explained, but um, what is the settings? What are the critical things that you found? What, where, where, where did you have some obstacles in, in getting the setup working? Yeah, um, first of all, you have to go in and make sure that the MIDI clock on the HX is turned off because there was some interference at first. I'm not, and the reason why it took me a, a little while to make some videos on the actual MIDI side, because I didn't quite have yeah. it figured out. <laughs> I was like, uh, how do I get this talking to each other? But once I got the MIDI clock turned off, that, that solved that. And, um, so, and really why I like so, so the MIDI clock, Sorry, the MIDI clock yeah. is, uh, is is it in, in control? I think it's... Control. No, it's... it's. I have a video nobles? on this. You sh I think you go to okay. uh, you go to MIDI tempo, and then the ah, third okay. off. the third one on there is the RX MIDI clock. Just turn it off. Yeah. Okay, so we will put a link on our live stream where you can watch 
Nathan's video because that's important. He has done some brilliant videos. I mean, you know, you are kind of the alive uh, test pilot mm -hmm. um, and that maybe uh, brought you up of creating these videos because, right. you know, you went through those uh, obstacles and th those problems and they, you found a solution for that. So people can um, kind of uh, use your knowledge there. So we will right. uh, put those links in, in this video here. Yeah, you can. Yeah. I have so a, no mi MIDI clock. Yeah, and you can see on my uh, on my camera right here that you just go to MIDI tempo. Yeah. RX mini clock off and you're good. So, yeah. Um, what I what I primarily like to do and how I set this up is I use the three lines right here on the top. So you just hit that and you okay. see signal flow, controller assign, command center, yeah. global settings. Yeah. When I'm setting up yeah. a rig, I always go to signal flow because what that allows me to do mm -hmm. is to see the whole chain at once, and then I can use yeah. the three knobs on top to move things back and forth and assign it to a certain switch yeah, yeah. and whatever else I need to do. So first thing you have to do in four cable method is make sure that you have whatever loop you're using. A there's loop. two loops. I, I use the second yeah. loop because that's on the bottom. Okay. And it frees mm -hmm. up the jacks on the top loop. If I want to uh -huh. add another pedal and I don't have to like try to move the cables underneath yeah, the other underneath. cable and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So I always yeah. use effects loop two mm -hmm. for my four cable mm -hmm. method. And so you, you can see here on the screen, you just, um, like you would go, you would push the big knob and you choose mm -hmm. uh, send return, push, mono, mm -hmm. go down to effects loop two, and then you're good to go. Because without that, you're basically, mm -hmm. this is what a lot of people don't understand about four cable method is, is like, where do I put all the cables? It's like, well, that's easy. I mean, you just go this and that and that and this and whatever. <laughs> But if but you they don't understand, yeah, but it's <laughs> like if you don't have an effects loop block in the yeah. digital signal chain, then the HX doesn't know that you're trying to use the four cable method, and it's just going to send the output yeah. of your of your unit to the effects return of your yeah. uh, of your amp, and that can be any amp. It doesn't yeah. matter if it's amp one sure. or uh, yeah, yeah. Mesa Boogie. It doesn't matter. Whatever. Let me restart yeah. my yeah. Uh, camera right here. Mm -hmm. All right, there we go. Every every twenty five minutes it, it resets. So, mm -hmm. um, start again. Um, so this is the sound of because right now I have the amp one on the vintage channel, but if you okay. don't have the effects loop block in the chain, this is what it sounds like. Yeah. It's like you're plugging your guitar into the effects return of the amp, and you're bypassing all the preamp sound in your rig mm -hmm. so once i turn back on the effects loop 2 like so now you get the vintage channel and it's like oh that sounds amazing <laughs> right yeah and it's the same way i mean i've had a boss es8 before and when setting that mm -hmm. unit up i came across the same issue it's like wait why is my sound not sounding through the amp like the preamp is like oh i have to right. have the the uh, little block turned the on loop. the loop turned on yeah. in order for you to hear it yeah. so whatever setup you have folks make sure you have that effects loop on in your chain so that way you yeah. connect all the internal parts and it knows Amps. what it's doing yeah. so uh, so that's always the first thing and then mm -hmm. uh i mean your setup like you said you have one preset or one bank that has just a clean channel with a little bit of effect sprinkled in and then another bank you have all the uh amp one channels channels options right. there like you know for as far as modern classic vintage whatever yeah. you want um so what i can do right now is i can go through the midi learn process just just for a mm -hmm. few uh things so you can see how that works so right now I'm on uh, preset five, and if I go to the three lines on top and go to command center, we have all these lightning bolts right here, as well as switches on the second little panel, and then we have the expressions. Because you can actually assign uh, MIDI messages to the expression pedal, and you can use the expression to control gain or power soak or I mean whatever you want. It's really cool. 
Mm -hmm. So on the first uh, lightning bolt, I have the bank PC as the command, MIDI channel one, I arrow over to the next page, and I, and for me, this is how my mind works. I didn't want to do like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because it was hard for me to remember which one was which. So for the right. clean channel, I'm doing PC message 10. And then yeah. for 20 is the vintage, 30 is the mm -hmm. classic, and then 40 is the mm -hmm. modern. Mm -hmm. And then the in-betweens, uh, like 15, 25, 35, 45, is the same channels, but with the boost added. So that's just guess, how... Guess what? Guess what? I have to make a little comment. Yeah. This was the first software version exactly like that um, on the M1. This was not even, hasn't even seen the US, but this was just like a preset M1 that uh -huh. just had these commands there. Okay. You have to tell this, yeah. And, and this, is, this is the way it was. Now with the MIDI Learn, you have the other option as well. But yeah, this is the way you think, great. Yeah. Oh, so you're Good saying idea. without the MIDI yeah. Learn, that was how it came pre-programmed? Yeah, originally it was. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Exactly like that. That's cool. Yeah, this was my initial thought. Yeah, so let's just okay. say I go... I, so first of all, you have to assign the PC message that you want. Go ahead and press yeah. Save. And then mm -hmm. we're on, we don't have to go to any other preset. This is what's cool about this unit is you stay on the same preset, set up the amp one however you want. So mm -hmm. right now it's on clean with no boost. So I'm going to hold down the boost button. Mm -hmm. And then the blue light is going to start blinking. I hit the preset and then bam, mm -hmm. the blinking stops immediately. And now it's yeah. set to the clean channel. Now, what's cool is mm -hmm. you don't have to go to different presets to start storing all the different MIDI learn messages. You can stay on the same preset. So go to mm -hmm. uh, three lines, command center, go back to my bank PC. Now I'm going to choose 15. Go ahead and hit save and then turn the boost on. Hold down boost. Mm -hmm. And then the light blinks, hit the preset, the light stops. And now you yeah. have the boost on. Done. So you just keep going yeah. through the same exact things for all the other uh, um, channels. And I actually it. reset yeah. my amp one because I've been doing different testings with other devices. And I found yeah. that other, other devices didn't like seeing the same PC message as the HX. So I reset everything. So let me do one more. Let me do mm -hmm. the vintage channel so I can show you some, uh, some gain reduction or uh you know cc20 yes, please, please. for the for the game yep. stuff so I'm, I'm doing this real time folks <laughs> so, mm, yep. you, so you can see it so i'm going to do vintage channel no boost and hold down boost to start the media learn process hit preset the blinking stops and you're good to go so now what i can do is let's say i want um, preset five do me my clean. So I'm going to go back to command mm -hmm. center, turn it back to 20. Oh, right, sorry, or 10. Hit save. I'm going to go to preset six, and there's nothing in here. So I'm going to go to signal flow real fast, hit my switch, or hit my little big knob, send a return, mono. And once you do this process, I mean, it's like riding a bike. I mean, you just know where to go and all that stuff. It's like, is it hard to use HX effects? It's like, no, you just learn the unit and it, you can get around with it pretty fast. Um, as you can see me doing. So command center, mm -hmm. bank PC, MIDI channel one, and then program changes on 20. So hit that. And if I go back to my preset five, you can see that change to clean channel because that's what I assigned mm -hmm. the preset five to be. Preset six is now vintage and it changed the vintage. You can see that mm -hmm. on my cameras right here. So really very quick and intuitive way to be like, all right, I want a, a good clean sound. Turn up my guitar here. And preset six is now vintage. It's like, all right, sweet. So now I got, now I'm slowly building my multi-channel amp setup, right? Because now I can access yeah. the, all the different channels and all that. Right. 
Now, what's really cool, and then there's a few guys on the on Facebook groups and whatever else that has discovered the zero gain setting, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which is really neat. So I'm going to go to another lightning bolt by uh, mm -hmm. scrolling over with a big knob. Now it says none. So I'm going to have to go in and choose MIDI CC command. Base mm -hmm. is going to be MIDI channel 1. CC is mm -hmm. going to be 20. Because that's the 20. that's the command we use to change our gain. And then yep. now our value in MIDI you have uh, is either from 0 to 127 or it can be 1 to 128 depending on if your unit starts at 0 or if it actually starts at 1. Yeah. Uh, but the HX starts Roland at 0. Has yeah, Roland has a different number system from whatever Yamaha and, and some other companies. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a bit confusing, but it doesn't matter. Like the lowest number is the lowest and the highest is the highest. Yeah, yeah. so you know? if you, even if it started with two, you would be able to go yeah. up to 129. So I mean, it's all the same. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to actually yeah. keep it on zero and mm -hmm. I'm going to hit save. And then I shouldn't have really have to do anything else. I just select the preset again. And now this vintage channel, which on the actual physical knob is set on 10, but we're mm -hmm. going to be hearing a lower gain sound. So. See, it's almost clean. So this one is now the vintage channel almost clean yeah correct? pretty much clean i mean if you even if you yeah. do your method thomas of even rolling off your volume yeah. knob yeah. then you give it even cleaner yeah and what i found is this this can be with any amp or any any switching kind of unit most of the time there's a little bit of a sound gap when you change mm -hmm. between, when you use a preset to change sounds on amp or maybe like another overdrive pedal or whatever it is. Um, and that's just the nature of really any kind of switching unit because it's all relays, right? The relay has yeah. to have time to make the switch. Go from one, and, yeah. And that's why you hear that gap in the sound. But you don't really get that with snapshots, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. So. I'm going to hit the uh, the mode button here. Wait, let me go. You have to hold you have to press the two bank buttons at the same time. And that's going to bring you into the snapshot mode. So snapshot 1 can be let's go to command center and make sure this is correct. Let's do 20 cc and so give me on 0, okay? So mm -hmm. now I can have my uh, my gain be on zero on snapshot one. Let's go to snapshot two. And we don't have to use a different uh, command. We just go to uh, the same lightning bolt, change the value. Now I'm gonna bring it up to like 60. That should be about halfway mm -hmm. up the gain level there. Press save. Right. And then hit snapshot two again. Snapshot one, see us lower gain. Right. Snapshot two is gonna be higher gain because we set the value at 60. And you hear that there's no gap in the sound because yeah. we're not actually changing presets, we're just changing snapshots, which is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's the biggest problem on those multi-effects units. Mm -hmm. If they change their whole preset, right. you know, like the processor has to load tons of things. And then MIDI is like a serial protocol that sends out the information to the M1. Right. And like you said at the beginning with the uh, MIDI tempo, this is kind of a congestion. There's too much information on that MIDI line. Right. And so. then, you know, the M1 comes too late. So if, as you can see, if the M1 is as fast as the, the signal coming to it, so, yeah. you know, this is why I designed my MIDI side as simple as possible to be as instant as possible. But you have to take care of the speed and what you send 
from your multi effects device. Right. So that's the secret. So yeah. um, just for me, kind of summing it up, is the HFX snapshots is the way to make the, the, the less glitching and faster switching. Right. That's, this is out of all the units I've ever had over the years, I mean, I've had a TC right. Electronic uh, G system, which is like the big spaceship looking yeah. thing. I've had the boss ES8. Yeah, silver one with the round up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really cool unit. Yeah. Um, I had yeah. a boss ES8. I've, I have the Headrush pedal board, as you can see from my YouTube channel. I have like over 100 Headrush videos alone. I mean, just on that one unit alone. And, I have, and I've done a video with the Blue Guitar Amp 1 and the Headrush as well. And But the mm -hmm. Headrush is a little limited on MIDI right now at the current moment. Because uh, mm -hmm. it can only send PC messages, but it can't do CC messages. It can receive ah, okay. CC messages, but it can't send CC messages. Send. So it's like, okay. mm -hmm. come on, guys, let's let's get this fully <laughs> fully functioning here, so we can we can yeah. have all the all the glorious options that the HX has as well. Um, yeah. And there's just uh, I've had analog type setups, but my goal throughout all the years was to have presets, be able to hit one switch and have things turn on and off automatically, you know, within like a split second and then right. have all the effects you'd want. And with this setup, you can have that. Uh, but real fast, I've, I've gone through snapshot three now and I've changed the MIDI value to 127. So now it's going to okay. reflect what's on the actual knob, which is set on 10 for the gain. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's snapshot one at the lowest gain here. Snapshot two. And then snapshot three. So you can hear the gain keeps stepping up each time right. you go. And now that you have that set up, now you can go back to signal flow. Now you can start adding in effects, right? So let's say that mm -hmm. your snapshot three is going to be your lead sound because that has the most gain. And now we want to add mm -hmm. some delay. So I'm going to uh, go over a block here. Let's go down to delay. Let's just do a simple delay just to keep it stupidly simple. And I kind of keep my mix around 30% or so. And then what's the time at? Time is, let's bring the time down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I think that you can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but the end of the, the memory man around 300 milliseconds. Was it 250 yeah, or uh, somewhere in there? I can't remember. You, you mean about the, the old uh, bucket bridge delay? Yeah, yeah, the there. actual original Memory Man unit. There, there, there are so many different versions of that. I have okay. uh, me, I have a, a three, a three different ones. Memory <coughs> Man Deluxe, the first one. Blah 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 blah. I, I like to to do the. Oh yeah, the, the space the kind of thing. And, this was my. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then a little slapback, uh, and that was Memory Man Deluxe, and maybe 300 milliseconds. Yeah, yeah around 300. So this is the yeah. uh, this is the snapshot three with a delay on now. Okay, so I was like, all right, sweet. Mm -hmm. And that's if you look at my rig, I just have the effects loop block in there to connect the four cable method, and I have a delay. Right. And the gain mm -hmm. is actually coming from the amp now and not an actual pedal. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, sweet. Yeah. But let me go one step farther mm -hmm. because even in my uh, my simple setup, I want at least some kind of boost or tube screamer or something. So um, let's hit the big knob, distortion, mono. Let's go down to scream 808. And I usually have the gain at least around zero, maybe like a one tone kind of in the middle, level up, hit save. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I can either have the Scream 808 off. <coughs> Sorry, it's early and no water. So. <laughs> Do that again. So here's to put that off. Right, you can hear that gain step up even more. Yeah. Because it's adding more yeah. mids, adding more volume. It's pushing the front end of the amp more. Yeah. Cooking yeah. the power tube a little bit more. Yeah. And it's like, so now you just have a basic overdrive, a delay, and the gain from the amp. 
Yeah. And if you're a simple, uh, simple player that don't need a lot, I mean, you can do it like, right there. Yeah, I mean, this is how how <coughs> I basically used to work with my rigs. Is like I'm I'm more or less a one channel guy, kind of guy, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And uh, if there are other channels available, uh, like with my M1. I do have one preset with the modern, but <laughs> I use it only once in a live show. Maybe, and sometimes I forget about it because most right. my sounds are all based around the vintage channel doing exactly what you're doing. You know, yeah. like ha having more and less gain and more uh, pedals in front of it. The, this is the old school classic way. And then the whole kind of tone is more coming from one center, from this kind of vintage, this is your guitar tone. So it's like a more, um, yeah, this is your voice. So and I've recorded know. with the Venice channel on a few yeah. projects now, and yeah. if you add that scream at a weight in front of it, um, it, high gets, gain. it, it yeah. gets a high gain sound. I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the modern channel is more like Mesa Boogie kind of, yeah. kind of flavor. But, I mean, as far as high gain goes, just crank up the gain knob on the amp. And, 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 and use a pedal, and then you, rock you, out, you can, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, hey, this was super, super cool to get this kind of deeper information from you, Nathan. And um, I want people to check out more of your videos. So we have uh, some links below um, under this live stream. Right. Um, we could talk for hours. We surely do after COVID-19. Hope Literally could. Yeah. We could talk for next, hours. Next yes. year, 2021, <laughs> I come and see you. And... Uh, in, in summer, yeah. when it's so hot in Nashville, it's like, uh, yeah, as Europeans, we, we have the same kind of heat, but not the humidity. Uh, uh, but it's, right. yeah, it, Nashville is such a cool town with, with all the music clubs, you know, on Broadway, uh, one bar after the other. I remember I was invited in a jam. It's so cool. And people, you know, um, let's, let's put it that way. I, I, I think people are basically super friendly and open and music is 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 the thing in Nashville you know everybody is somehow connected right. to music and that makes Nashville for me a nice place to be it's it's like I love this the spirit and um, last time I was staying at this what was it five star or five point kind of uh, where all the coffee shops are and pizzerias and some smaller venues and and their live bands playing outside even at well, when it's hot in the evening it's so cool you hear like five different songs at the same yeah, time yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> you're like this song over here and this song over here and yeah you got a a lot of times on broadway you'll see an actual drum set set up on the on the sidewalk yeah and some guys just <laughs> laying down a groove just with nothing else playing along it's like okay well that's that's cool yeah but i mean nashville to me <laughs> is definitely a place uh for a musician um to visit at least once in your life um at least once uh, yeah. if not if not just live here i mean you know <laughs> that, that this is your decision i i enjoy coming there every year and um i'm sh i'm sure yeah. we stay in, in touch and i i will see you next year and um yeah, thank you so much. And please watch Nathan's, Dr. Nathan McFerrin's videos here on YouTube. And um, he spent... Let me yeah. let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story real fast, yeah. Thomas. So back in college, uh, my friend Robbie, he uh, we were in songwriting class together and we started doing music yeah. together. And he started calling me Dr. McFarland because <laughs> I heal people with sweet rock and okay. roll. And I was like, all right, I can I can take on that 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 persona. Um, so it, so even farther nowadays in my recording, I love like editing audio and do all that stuff. So now I say I, I get surgical with audio. So I'm keeping that doctor lingo going. So healing people, sweet rock and roll, getting surgical with the audio. Call the doctor. I'll help you out. So <laughs> and it's a good one. I you know um, yeah, doctor, doctor, please. Uh, yeah, this is, um, you know, now since I know even a bit more about your background, you know, the more 
this universe of music and a, and, and a guy like you that loves the music and the instruments and the technology and any aspect of the mus life as a musician producer, you know, getting the whole picture. Yeah, next, next year we, right. we, we have some dinner, you know, one of those nights where we... And be sure, be sure you check out Reverend Guitars yeah, cool. as well. I've had tons of guitars over the years, but once I found... Uh, the Reverend brand out of yeah. Ohio. Uh, they just make really excellent guitars. And uh, this is actually a Warhawk RT for like Riftron pickups. But it's got the Bixby yeah. on it. It's got like, this cool like almost Firebird, Firebird looking like mid block going on. And, um, you know, the headstock's really cool with the tuner right. and tuners. And yeah, so check them out. I got four. I had the Trifecta. And then I added another reverence, so now I have the yeah. Mega Quad. And if I add a fifth one, it's going to be the the Penta, the Penta something, yeah. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> and the cool thing about reverent um, guitars is once you play one of those, you have your own nickname. It's not Doctor, so you become Reverend Thomas Bluke, or you become Reverend Peter Miller. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and and to your to your connection with yeah. vintage guitars. Uh, Reverend actually uses Wilkinson tr uh, hardware, hardware yeah. uh, for their for their tremolo systems and their um, um, their lock and tuners and stuff. So uh, Wilkinson is all over the the map as far as guitars and what hardware yeah. they put on and all that stuff. So no, it's cool. I'm, I... And they, and they and they won't get they will not go yeah. out of yeah. tune. Um, contrary to popular opinion on some other videos, was like, hey, tune your guitar. I was like. Oh, sorry, I didn't tune my guitar, <laughs> but um, like the the whole the whole whammy bar thing, like you can just go off and it stays on in that tune. thing. It just it'll stay yeah. perfectly in tune, so it just works. Yeah, so yeah. I, love I it, played so. one. I, I'm not sure which model, but I played one, and they are they're really good guitars. They are dynamic. They feel great. They sound. Mm -hmm. it, it, I like dynamic guitars. That's the thing, and they, they come alive. And right. yeah, I'm you know there's some good stuff out there, and Reverend guitars too. Sure. So, hey, yeah. um, thank you for joining in. Um, maybe we wait in the future. Maybe we do a future episode if there's news to share about Nashville, about whatever studio kind of thing. And um, yeah. yeah, hey guys, uh, please check out Dr. Nathan McFarland's videos here on YouTube. So, Nathan, all the best and see you soon. <laughs> yeah. Take care, man. Thanks, Thomas, for having Take me. Pleasure. It was fun. Yeah, it was really great having Nathan here on our live stream. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to come to Nashville next year. Um, I think if you have any more questions, please go on um, and check out Nathan's um, uh, videos he has done on YouTube. And there's more guys on the Facebook a user group using the Line 6 HX effects. Um, we'll have more episodes about uh, different processors in the combination with M1. Stay tuned because there's uh, a lot of um, interesting people um, doing that kind of combination and uh, I know more than you and you will find out in the future episodes some killer musicians and some more to come. Okay. Hey, thanks for watching. I think this was the biggest live and the longest live stream ever so far. <laughs> and um, I hope you enjoyed it and got um, a little background information about deep sheer technical stuff. And of course, a little bit more about um, people in Nashville and uh, Nathan McFarland. Okay. Stay tuned. Stay safe. See you soon. Next week, don't miss our episode on Academy of Tone. Cheers.